It's about being humble, of having humility. And humbleness is not what, is not, I'm not talking about the appearance of humility. I'm talking about actual humility, being a humble person. And by that, I don't mean that you're going to live in the worst house, drive the worst car, be poor, and just be beat down. I'm talking about being a person that understands that without God, you can't live. Period. There's no, you don't have to add anything to that. You and I, no matter who we are, no matter where we're at in life, what status we have in life, we cannot live without God. You need God. Just like you need water, you need oxygen, you need God. If you don't have God, you're dead and you're on your way to dying a terrible death. But when you have God, you've got everything. You've got the opportunity to live your life to the maximum potential. And you've got the opportunity to live life like you've never dreamed or thought or even planned about doing, about living it that way. You can live life like no other person can live it if you got God, you know. First Peter chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 5 to 7. I don't know, I normally speak in Spanish, so I'm translating this as I'm going along. So if I, if I say a word in English that you say, where the heck did he get that word from? I'm thinking the very same thing, right? So we're, it makes two of us now. Uh, once in a while I say something, my wife will look at me. I said, don't look at me. Like She said, what the heck was that? I said, that's what I said too in my mind. But I just kept going because it was too... Too difficult to correct at the moment, you know. So once in a while, I, I, I come up with some words that are not in the dictionary, you know. And I'm translating my notes. So this is what it says. In the same way, you younger men must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you serve each other in humility. For God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. And what, what oppose mean is that God stops you in your tracks and he puts a hand on you on your on your forehead and you cannot advance he doesn't allow you to advance in life when you are proud but if you are humble he favors you and he gives you his grace and his mercy and his favor and he does everything for you that no one else could do for you but you have to be humble so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, and remember this, at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. I'm going to give you four reasons why God opposes pride and hates pride. He doesn't hate the proudful. He hates pride. He hates the very spirit of, of pride. So that means that God loves you and he loves me in a very special way. And he cares for us. The first reason is this. We're going to get right into it. I don't have too many Greek words or Hebrew words or none of that because I'll get more confused, you know. Then I won't even understand what I'm saying, you know. Uh, I went to Wheaton College one time and they told me, can you speak on Revelations for the whole week? And I spoke on Revelations for the whole week. And afterwards, they called me in the office and the dean of men said, if you ever come back here again, which I don't think you will, never open up your Bible to Revelations again. And I said, do you have my check? He said, yes. I said, that is the greatest revelation that you've ever given me, man. I'm on my way to the airport, buddy. And, and uh, my wife told me, she said, what in the world? Where in the world did you get all that from? I said, I heard somebody else say it. I thought it was good, so I said it too. So uh, no, no, no Greek words today. No, no great, you know, explanation. Just one thing. God hates pride because it opposes his power, right? It oppose, when, you, when you're proudful, you're telling God, I don't need your power. Your power has no power in my life. 
But when you humble yourself, you're underneath the mighty and powerful hand of God. His covering, his provision, his protection. And God is going to take care of you as long as you're underneath that hand. Right? But when you're above that hand, you're telling God, I don't need you for anything, man. You know, I don't need you for anything at all. It's like a guy that's on the plane and he, the guy next to him says, my father owns 18 oil companies, petroleum companies, you know. My father owns 36 other companies, you know. And the guy says, your father is my father's flunky. Right? <laughs> he told him, all your father does is go to the store for my father. And that guy almost, he almost jumped out the plane, right? He said, who is your father? He said, my father is God Almighty who created heaven and earth, the universe, and everything that is within. It's two different things. When you acknowledge God and when you don't acknowledge God. When you acknowledge God, you sit in that seat and you say amen and praise God. And you lift your hands and you say, I can't get enough of this God whom they're speaking about. You know, you come in this place, you're humble. You come in this place, you recognize your need and you're ready to worship God. You're ready to give him everything that you can because God is your mighty protector, keeper. So you got to be under the mighty hand of God. You know, you can't be on top, on, on top of it. If you're not underneath there, then you're in a place of telling God, I don't need you. How many of you need God tonight? Man, we need God desperately, you know, desperately. When you're underneath that protection of God, you don't have anything to worry about. When you're not under that protection, you have everything to worry about. I've been flying for about 48 years now. My wife always tells me when I leave, she says, I love you. And I say, in case I don't come back, I love you. And I have been faithful to you, woman. So I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> and on Monday morning, she'll tell me, are you coming home? I said, you bet. I ain't got no other bed to go to, man. My TV is there. My food is there. My clothes is there. I just got a suitcase full of dirty clothes. I'm coming home in a little while. And she laughs, you know. She always, she always thinks I'm kidding about everything, you know. But, you know, kids are that way, you know. How many of you got children? How many of you know that when your kids were home, they were under, under your powerful hand, your protection, your provision, Right? We gave them food, we gave them home, we gave them everything that they needed. Once in a while, we gave them a good old down whooping, right? <laughs> you know? And, uh, uh, but we took care of them. The only time we couldn't take care of them correctly was when they rebelled. And they opposed that mighty hand of power that they thought was just ruling their lives. You know, but you take all these, I was going to say older folks, but you take these adults here and they will, we don't like to be called older folks, right? But you take all of them and ask them and they will tell you stories of how, what they went through and the, all the stuff that they lived, how that helped them become who they are, whether it was good or bad. Because today you treat somebody bad, they write a book and become millionaires. Right? I got a friend of mine that wrote a book, man, and he became wealthy. And one day he was complaining. I said, man, you got to stop complaining. All them whoopings and them chains you say your father tied you up with and, and threw you in, in the trunk and drove you around town and whatnot, that made you power, prosperous, man, and made you popular, man. Just thank God that he did that, you know. And he told me, he said, are you crazy? I said, no, but, you know. I wish they would have tied me up with chains and threw me in the back of a trunk too. I'd have wrote a book. I'd be driving the car you're driving. You know, right? Whether bad or good, they make us into the people that we are today. That's why the Bible says all things work together for good to them to love God. You know, that's what, the, that's what my brother was, was saying when he got up here, you know. 
I thought he was going to sing. I said, man, I'm going to have to run around this building now. This guy's going to make us run around this building. I said, this is some crazy guy from, from San Francisco, you know. And right now I'm going to have to jump up and run, man. And, and I'm too old for that, you know. Uh, so I was glad when he prayed and I seen him over there. I said, thank you, Jesus. You know, thank you, man. I didn't have to, I didn't have to go through all that, all that exercise tonight, man. But whether or not you live good or bad, it helps you become who you are, you know. And I praise God for that, you know. All my life wasn't good. Beginning of my life was terrible. Later on, I became a Christian. Later on, things got better. I even got a wife and children. And all kinds of good things have happened to me, you know. So I understand, I understand this one principle. And that is that God wants... To have his mighty hand over you. To take care of you. Don't ever forget that when you come in here say, God, don't allow me to get out from underneath your covering and your mighty hand. Number two, it destroys people. Pride destroys you. Listen to what it says. In, in, in his time, he will... Reach down with his mighty hand and pick you up and nobody will be able to put you down. Isn't that powerful? Today, even in the church and even men and women of God and singers and everything, they're trying to get on the platform. They're trying to get in social media. They're trying to look as good as they possibly can because they want to portray an image of themselves as being victorious, as being powerful, as being triumphant. And all God is saying, if you humble yourself, I'll reach down here, pick you up. And put you in a place where no one can take you down from there. There's some, there's some people in here today that you're afraid that God is not going to reach down and put you in the place where you should be. It says if you humble yourself, God will what? Exalt you. If you exalt yourself, God will put you down. And we don't, we, you know, listen, I travel all over. I've been in some of the largest churches in the world. Been with some of the great speakers all over the world. Everything. I'm always in awe of the people I'm with, you know. I, but I'm the same person down there that I am up here. I come down from here and my wife always tells me when I go home. She said, hey man, don't believe everything they were telling you in church tonight. You know, we got to go home and take the garbage out. And I said, I'm going back to church. You know, I'm going to sleep in church tonight. I get more respect in church than I do here. But my wife's always been like that. She's always told me, hey, relax, man. They, they just don't know you. <laughs> if they knew you, they wouldn't even shake your hand. She says, so thank God that I'm taking you home, even though I know you, <laughs> right? But, but that, that's the thing. You got you to be able to come down from here. And say, I'm the same person down here that I was up there. The suit doesn't change you. You know, humility is not something that you pick out of your closet. It's not something that you put on a facade. Humility is born inside of the heart of a man or a woman that recognizes that they cannot live without God. And they say, man, if, if I don't have God, I don't have anything. But if I got God, I got everything. And there's nothing impossible for me because God is inside of me. You know, when God raises you up, nobody can put you down. I remember pastors would tell me, you ain't never going to make it, Joe. I said, Ben, I, 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 I believe you. I believe you. I'm trying to believe the Bible. <laughs> you ain't helping me though. When I married my wife, they told me, don't marry that woman. That woman's bad for you. But I said, but, but I love that girl, man. It's the only one I love. And she's the only one that loves me back. 
closet. It's either now or never. I said, life's too short. I can't take a, I can't take a chance that she's not going to be there. You know, and I told her one day, I told this old guy in church, a little old man in church. I told him, man, I need, a count, I need some advice, man. Some old people advice. People that have been around like 200 years. And he said, I'm not 200 years old, but you look it, man. So he told me this. He took me, put his arm. You know, old people always put their armor on you. Come on, son. They walk with you, you know. And I was walking. I said, this is how I'm going to walk when I'm old, man. <laughs> Shoot. And he told me, he says, do you love this woman? I said, I sure think so, man. He said, then marry her. None of them people are going to live with you. You don't have to let them come sleep at your house. Marry her and be done with it. So I went back and told, told him, the gal that's my wife now. I said, we're going to get married, man. I ain't messing around. She said, you have somewhere to live. I said, yo, don't start demanding things so soon. We're not even married yet. You're already telling me where we're going to live. We'll figure that out along the way, baby. And we figured it out for 46 years, you know, right? I came home one day and told her, we're leaving the United States. She said, where are we going? I said, I, I think Mexico, man. She said, you know anybody down there? I said, no, we're going together. So I already got a good friend. And we're taking these two guys because we can't live them, leave them here, man. They're our children, man. And they were like this. Where? But how many of you know that if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that mighty hand will reach down there and grab a hold of you and put you in a place that nobody... Nobody, 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 I mean nobody can put you down. Only God or yourself can put yourself down. You remember that. You remember when God reaches down and grabs a hold of you and puts you in a place, nobody, nobody is going to put you down because God put you there. And you know why that ruins people? Because either you put yourself up or either God puts you up. If you put yourself up, you're a candidate for God to put you back down. But if God puts you, if you put yourself down and God puts you up, you're a candidate to continue to go to the next level, to the next level. And there's no stopping because God is a mighty God. He's got great things in store for you. I went to the university and my, my philosophy professor told me, he said, you have to be the dumbest man in the world. And I said, and you have the privilege of teaching and the challenge of trying to teach this dumb man. So get with it, baby. <laughs> Two years ago, I went back to my university. I went there as a speaker for the homecoming, right? He was sitting there and he looked, he pointed at a Bible that he had in his hand. And I said, you got saved? He said, I think so. Because that's how philosophy scholars talk. I, they always think so. You know, they're always thinking, you know. And I said, you th are you saved or not? And he said, uh, you better make up your mind, man. And he said, I am. And he got up and he gave me this hug. And he told me, you must have been the worst student I ever had. And I told him, you were the worst teacher I ever had. I never knew what the heck you were talking about. And they paid you that great salary. And he told me, he says, you, you didn't learn anything? I said, I cheated on your exam, man. I have to tell you, man. That's the only way I got through philosophy. <laughs> we became good friends, imagine, man. reaches down, he puts you up. If you put yourself up, you destroy yourself. Don't destroy yourself. In his time, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but in his time, God is going to reach down and place you in the place that he wants you to be.
Number three, it takes your peace away from you. Pride doesn't allow you to be at peace with yourself or with God. Because proud people are always scheming and conniving on how they're going to accomplish whatever it is that they want to accomplish. I was a schemer all my life. <laughs> my wife sometimes tells me, what are you scheming on? I said, a sandwich. <laughs> and she said, just ask for one. I said, I always ask for one, and it takes me a long time to get it. So I'm scheming on how I can get it quickly, right? And she says, if you go to Tiffany, you might get it really quick. And I say, you mean the bakery down the corner, Tiffany? And she says, no. But we're always playing this game, you know. And, and, and I was a schemer all my life. I, I, I lived lying and cheating and doing everything that you can do. And when I came to the Lord and I sat in church, I used to sit in the front pew. They used to try to chase me away from there, the ushers and whatnot. They didn't want me up there. They said, this is reserved. I said, for who? Nobody here. I've been here for three months. Nobody's ever sat here. Would you tell this guy to hurry up and get here? When he comes, tell me he's here and I'll get out. And they, the pastor used to say, man, obey the ushers. I said, well, they're always telling me all these stories like there's somebody coming to that seat. And nobody's ever there. So I said, so I'm occupying it until that guy gets there. But I used to sit there because I wanted to be close to the preachers. And then preachers would get up and preach. And I said, that's how I want to preach one day. That's me right there, man. And then they would look at me and say, who are you? I said, I'm saving this seat, man. <laughs> this guy hasn't come to church for three and a half years. I'm saving this seat. One day he's going to get here, man. And I want this seat to be there for him. <laughs> he would <laughs> and that preacher said, boy, you're sick. I said, I'm here, man, listening to you. Keep on. Be messing with me, man. You came, you came here to preach. Oh, man. I would sit there all the time. You know why? Because I would, I, would, I would look at the people that preach and I would say, man, God, just give me a little bit of that. That's all. Just give me a little bit of that. Now, there were some guys that came that I said, don't give me none of that. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I said, ooh, get that off me right now, man. Whatever that is he got, I don't want it. There was, some, there was a woman that came one night. She was like, she had this black dress on. She looked like a, like a bat, man. And she would say, <laughs> and I said, what the, you know? But that lady was so anointed. I said, Lord, I don't want the Batman and all that stuff, but give me a little bit of what she's got on the inside. All that bat, I, I, I refuse that, you know? I, and my wife used to tell me, you better stop making fun of it. I said, I'm not making fun. That's the way I visualize it. And she, I remember she prayed for my wife. My wife only has one kidney. and Her other kidney was giving her a problem. And the doctor said, man, if God doesn't heal her. And I, I said, God, I, I looked at that operation that they used to do before. It was like 300 stitches. And I said, I want to give her my kidney, Lord, but that's a lot of pain. So please heal her, you know. <laughs> I'll say, it'd be easier if you heal her and leave me intact. <laughs> and that lady came and she was floating around on the platform and scaring us. And all of a sudden she said, I believe some people should be here. And I don't know what in the world I did, but I got up and I walked up there. And then I look back at my wife. I say, it's your kidney that's not working. Get up here, man, before she prays for me and gives me another kidney. <laughs> so my wife came up, and she walked by my wife, put her hand on the side that she didn't have a kidney, and she said, God's going to make you whole. And then she pointed to me and said, you have little faith on the other hand. And I just, I just went into one, one of those, you know, when you don't want to hear it, you... 
I just went off like the Holy Ghost was all over me. I said, I'll get her away from me now. And she went on her way, right? <laughs> but listen to what it says. It says, humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. How many of you know God wants to honor you? Wants to honor your life. You might not mean anything to anybody else, but to God, you mean the world to him. And it says, give all your worries and cares to God. That's what it says. Let me get a, a little tissue or something here before I have to use my jacket, man. Thank you, sir. My wife always tells me, she said, don't breathe into the mic. And she said, don't do that. And I said, what am I going to do, breathe out my ear? I swear I breathe through my nose, man. But she, you know, she's, she's, real, she's real proper. And, and I tell her, I said, man, I need to breathe out of my nose, woman. Leave me alone. I got asthma and three other things, complications there, man. <laughs> Casting all your cares on him. How many of you know we come in here and sometimes we're burdened down with all kinds of things in our lives? Some of us drag in here, man. <laughs> Look like we're ice skating in water, man. We come in here, man, sing, worship, and drag back out. Because we're dragging something that God never meant for us to drag. There's things that you can do and there's things that I can do and there's things we can't do. Period, man. My son was missing for two years. My youngest son. He'd be 41 years old today. He passed away and went to be with the Lord. You know. I didn't see him for two years. I didn't know where he was. I had no clue. I didn't know whether he was in jail, dead, in a hospital, whatever. But I would wake up at night and go into the living room and I'd see my wife sprawled on the floor, man, just praying for me. I'd go back to bed and pray and ask God. And one day this guy came and told me, the Lord told me to tell you, when you get off this boat, the first phone call you're going to receive is your son. And I told him, listen, whatever you do, do not tell that to my wife. Because if you're not really sure that that's a word from God, I'm going to throw you overboard. And I told him exactly like that. And he told me, hey, pastor, you know, you know me, man. I said, that's why I'm telling you this. I'm trying to threaten you into saying a sure word, man. But he went and told my wife. So it was like I told him, please run and tell her. He told her. My wife started to weep. I got off the, I was afraid to turn my phone on. I turned my phone on in Miami, and the first phone call that came in was my son. You know how I went to church? You know how I went to preach for two years? You know how I prayed for other people? Say, don't worry, man. God's got your children in his hand, you know? It wasn't that easy. It's not that easy. Sometimes people look at the preachers, and they think it's just easy for us to preach. They think we don't have no burdens, you know. They think we have a lot of money all the time and everything is just fine. They think we never come here and because we smile and we rejoice and we give a word and we pray and we let God use us, sometimes you think that everything is okay. Well, let me give you some good news and some bad news. It sometimes isn't okay. It's sometimes messed up. It's sometimes that I don't want to come here and preach. I would rather go home and get in a closet and stay there. But because of the call of God, you come and you do it. And sometimes it seems like you're preaching to yourself so I so so you bring in that burden you you have your children you have you have you have your family members you have financial burdens you got all these things that are going on in your life and you come here and the Lord is holding his arms out saying give me that man. let me take it from you give it to me I want to lighten the load man you know, I carry a backpack and my wife says, what do you have in here? I says, all your magazines and stuff. I ain't got nothing in there. I carry this around for you. I'm your, I'm your assistant. 
But I got this. And sometimes they, somebody tells me when I get to a church, give me that backpack. I, they say, give me your suitcase. I said, take the backpack, bro. Take the backpack. That's the biggest load I got. When they take it, I straighten out, man. I can walk. I'm walking through the airport. My wife says, you're getting hunchback. I said, you're making me hunchback. Because you can't carry that load. There's just things you can't do. I'm sorry, you know. There's things money can't solve. There's the, it don't matter what house you live in. We had a, an 11,000 square foot home at one time. I used to have to tell my wife, yo. I started, I bought some walkie-talkies. I said, yeah, where are you, man? I've been looking, man, I need a sandwich. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go crazy here. I'm calling Subway right now. They bring me a sandwich. And she would say, she would say, I'm right behind you. <laughs> huh? So there's things you can do, there's things I can do. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what people think of you. When people come to the church and say, Pastor, you're a blessing. We love you so much. I'd walk away thinking, man, I wish they would stop loving me that much. I don't even love myself that much, you know. You cast your cares on him things you can't carry, the things you can't bear. And you have some of those things. Tonight, some of you are right here with all these things on your back that you can't carry. And you, you're bound to take them back out because you don't want to leave them to God. We get accustomed to carrying that backpack. We get used to it. Before, my wife used to take three suitcases. Now I got it down to a little roll, roller board, man. Just throw it on the airplane, you know. And, and uh, I don't know how she gets all this other stuff wherever we go. We end up having to buy a, another backpack or something, you know. But I told her, I can't carry all them suitcases around. At that time, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't fly a lot, so I had to pay everywhere we went. We started leaving all that stuff that we didn't need. You don't need all the stuff that you got that's burdening you down. The only way that you're going to lug that around is if you want to. You don't have to, but some of us want to. We get used to it. You have to learn to throw all them things down on the Lord. And say, God, I can't, I can't deal with this. Everywhere I went, people would come up with things about me when I first was saved. And, and I, I had to learn to throw that on God every, every time I could. I just said, God, here. And the burden got lighter and lighter and lighter. I still got things, but I ain't carrying them on my back. Because I can't carry them. So I give them to somebody that's more than willing to carry them for me. His name is Jesus. The fourth thing. Casting all your cares on him because he cared for you. You don't want to be robbed of one of the greatest experiences that a man or a woman can have. And it's not being a preacher and going all over the world and being a singer. None of that. Um, that carries its own burden. It's being able to stand up and say, God has never left my side. He has always been with me. That's what he was talking about. Not that God saves you out of every peril perilous situation you're in and I don't even know what perilous means. I heard a guy today on the in the in the I heard a guy say something we're, we're in perilous times and I said a perilous situation that's what I'm gonna say tonight. Sound great. It almost like looked like I went to the university, right? My philosophy teacher was here. He don't know what that means. But it doesn't matter. It it doesn't mean that he pulls you out of all that danger. It means that he jumps in there with you and stands by your side and says, don't worry, man. I'm with you, buddy. It's me and you. 
You know, I used to interpret for a preacher. We were in Guatemala. He was a funny guy, man. He was one of these guys from Mississippi, man. I, I never understood what he was saying. So I'd make up things to say, right? Because he had this southern accent that was, you know, like strong. And he talked to me and I said, man, I don't know if he's telling me split P or P split, you know, right? But he would always say, so he told me one day, I made it in the, I built the platform and I built a big indent in the back and I put a mattress in there. And he said, what is this for? I said, they shoot at preachers here. They've killed a couple of preachers here. So when you hear the shots, that's where we go. And then we crawl down, and we get, we get out of here, man. And he told me, he said, are you scared? I said, of bullets? Yes. <laughs> so they shot at us one night. They shot all the lights out, the speakers. And I was in there. And I was looking for him. I was trying to get up. And I felt somebody under me. And he was already there. <laughs> right? So he tells me, hey, man, my briefcase is on the platform. Can you get it? I said, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, I'll give you the offering <laughs> if you get up there and get the briefcase. I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> now, who's on the piano, man? Who's the, who's the piano man here? I don't know. He left, man. Well, that's all right. Piano lady is good too, okay? Now listen, we're going we're gonna to finish. I, I, got, I got a drive to Dallas tonight. I didn't, I didn't plan on staying here, but I'm glad I did because I got to meet you and I got to share a little word with you. you know? Now, if you don't like me, don't worry about it, man. Just join the club, man. It's all right. I, I, sometimes I don't like the churches I go to either, you know, so... You know, me and, me and Ugo will talk on the way back. I didn't like that lady that was in the fourth row, man. I didn't like that guy there that didn't have no hair, you know. I didn't like that other guy over here. That guy in the front that was always smiling, man, right? I, I'll, I'll say ten things to him on the way. Remind me, man, all right? I got a couple of good ones, man. But imagine that you would be able to stand up and say, listen, when everybody else left me, God cared for me. You don't want to miss that. I want to be able to stand up and when people are complaining and people are, are bickering and, and, and fussing, I want to tell them, hey man, wake up. God has never forsaken me. I want to say that. I want to say it from inside here. I want to mean it. I don't care if I'm going through the most difficult time of my life. I want to be able to say God has cared for me all the time. Now listen, my son, 35 years old, he's got cancer. Calls me up one day and says, Dad, I got about four or five months to live. So I fly out to Denver, Colorado. He lived, he lived in Eagle, Colorado. He was a snowboarder, man. And uh, I went out there. I stood in front of him, man. The doctor told me on the way in. He said, listen. There's nothing we can do. He'll die in three to five months. He says, I know you're a man of God. If God doesn't heal him, he's going to heaven. You got to tell him. I walked into that room, sat down with my son, and I told him, son, I got to tell you something. What you got is not treatable. So if God doesn't heal you, you're going to beat me to heaven. And he looked at me with this really cool smile he always had on his face. It used to make me mad once in a while. I said, wipe that smile off your face. And he looked at me and smiled and said, Dad, it's okay. Man. I'm ready to live for God and I'm ready to die for God. And I never forget that, man. One day, a buddy of mine pastor in San Diego called me up. He said, hey man, I'm on my way to Denver. I want to spend the day with Ephraim. I said, I'm here, man. I'm getting something to eat. He said, I'll just get there and rent a car and go and then I'll leave, you know. I want to spend four or five hours with him. I just have, have him on my heart. You know? 
these guys were in youth group together, you know. So he gets on a plane, comes to the hospital. I finish eating. I'm sitting there with my wife. We're talking. We're drinking coffee. And I said, let's go up. The pastor said he was coming. I open up the door and the nurse tells me, there's a guy in there that's been singing for about two hours. And I told him, who is he? She said, I don't know. He said he knows you, knows your son, and he's a pastor. But he's in there singing away, man. He doesn't stop. I opened that door, man. He was standing by my son's bed, and he had his hand, and he was just singing scripture to him. He's got a great voice, man, so he was just singing scripture to him, and singing scripture, and singing. Tears were running down his face. My son was crying. I started to cry. My wife started to cry. The nurses were crying, man. The attendants were crying. And, and he just kept singing. All of a sudden, he finished. He hugged my son, walked out, hugged me, hugged my wife, kissed my wife. I don't know how come they always kiss my wife. They never kiss me, man. I walked away. I was just, I couldn't contain myself. And as I was there crying, I thought about that scripture verse. In Job 35.10 that says that nobody asks me where is my God who comes down at night and sings to me. Right? It sings to me. What a testimony to be able to say in my darkest moment, in my most painful moment, the group was singing about taking the pain, about breaking the chains, man. That just my heart man because how often we come in and we sing and we go through all the motions but we leave with the same amount of pain it just is multiplied and we should come in here and let God do what he wants to do let him take us by the hand let him come down from heaven and sing to you and tell you I am here you're not alone I will never leave you nor forsake you Today, I say to you, God is so anxious to come and sing to you when nobody else is around. We always look for a pastor to give us a comforting word. We always look for a preacher to give us a word direct from God. We look for a song to touch our hearts. And we forget that at night you can open up your heart and say, God, I need you to sing to me tonight. I need you to come and say to me in a song what you, what you mean to me, what I mean to you. My purpose, my destiny, everything about my life. And God will come down and sit by your bedside, take you by the hand and sing to you like no one else can sing to you. You believe that? I want you to stand. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.